Good evening. Tonight in True Stories, a behind-the-scenes look at American comedian Roseanne Arnold and the cutthroat business of situation comedy in Feeding the Monster. My reaction is it was disgraceful. Feed me. Well, I've got three kids and a job, and I can't be everywhere, okay? So I've got to trust my kids, and they're still alive, so I've obviously done something right. So now you're a better mother because you have more children? Yes. I have three and you only have one. Three to one, get it? I have three, I win. Feed me. Oh, we're not talking about us. Look, I have one drink and you're acting like I'm an alcoholic. Oh, quick, I'll call the 800 number. <laughs> we are your 800 number, Becky. Feed me. Ta-da! We looked like we were separated at birth. Feed me. Here we go, Bob. <laughs> All right, we have to be everyone real quiet. You guys really want to know where the show really happens. <laughs> Follow me. Uh oh, wardrobe room. Yeah. <laughs> this is where everything really goes down. <laughs> this is Erin. She's a wardrobe designer. But her boyfriend's a writer on the show. So. This is really where everything goes down. All the good, juicy stuff yeah. happens in here. A lot of eating. A lot of eating. <laughs> a lot of eating, a lot of inspecting body parts, close up in the mirror. <laughs> chicken picante. Picante? Yeah. Uh, chicken sure. Egg. Boneless chicken. <laughs> Nine. Nine. <laughs> Nine, Nine because it's funnier than eight and That's ten. That's right. Ten, ten. Oh, isn't it fine, no. But it's chicken, so it doesn't matter how many. Yeah, because it's chicken. It's because it's chicken. Any number of chickens. It's chicken already is funny. funny. That's chicken. 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 chicken in the kitchen. Chicken's funny in the kitchen. This is the lair of the goddess. <laughs> where the actual worship of Mother Nature goes down, where I come up with all the ideas for the anti male slant of the show. <laughs> hey, hey, easy. <laughs> I'm here as a result of a, a rather highly publicized purge that happened um, two seasons ago uh, when Rosie felt that she was not being listened to. She was doing her best to communicate to the writers and the producers, but she felt that her viewpoint was not being expressed in the final product. And there was a battle, and uh, the result of that battle was that um, those writers are no longer here, and, and I am. We usually start with a story that we like to make as much sense as possible. One of the words used to describe this series is real. So we take special care to find a story and to ground it in as much of a reality as we possibly can. Done. Done. <laughs> when we all gather and the first pass is laid down, we then work on jokes. And the way you start with a good joke, I think around here a lot of the time, is by starting with bad jokes. All right. Huh? You know uh, where I like stuck. No, no, no. He was way back in line. He gave me a buck. Is what you hear all ask, and then boom. You're being asked to write uh, for this show 25 plays uh, in... 40 some odd weeks and you want each play to be something admirable and um the time is ridiculous i mean a playwright if you were to write a short two-act play 
would have months and months to write it. And then he'd take it out of town, and he'd have the actors do it, and he'd watch it, and he'd watch it, and he'd hone it and whatnot. We have sometimes two or three days to write a script, three days of rehearsal, and one day to shoot it. Santa Claus is coming to town? Yes. The dark side of it is uh, you're under the gun. The amount of people that watch this show is so phenomenal, and you don't want to let them down. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous the amount of numbers of people that watch television and you kind of feel like gee you want to you know you don't want one flat moment not even one you want each one to be perfect and it's impossible okay, so I'll take it. Oh, all the scripts that get developed are like me and tom would come up with them or whoever comes up with them they run them past us and so i approve of all of them first i approve of all the beats you know all the acts each scene and then who is it well i'm busy yeah I'm busy, asshole. Well, we're ready when you are. Okay. okay. But um, we like to torture Mark. We love to torture Mark. Yeah. Because he's easy. Yeah, he gets tortured easily. And he's he very camera fan. conscious, so we'll especially <laughs> like to torture him today. <laughs> uh, but okay. So then they, then I I get the script like Friday, and then I give notes on it for the Tuesday reading. Usually this whole year it's been really good and I've given really minimal notes. But the last two weeks we had a, a uh, we had to throw out one script on and do a total rewrite on Thursday, <coughs> and we had Shelley Winters on. The bloodless coup. It was a <laughs> bloodless coup. They they tried to <laughs> mutiny against me that week, so I was busily shutting them down and rewriting and some of them boycotted the show and that's why the script stinks this week too. What's the matter, Don? Did you have a rough day? How did you guess that? Well, what happened? Nothing happened. That's what happened. Buddy and Sally and I sat around and stared at each other for eight hours, and Alan Brady's in there screaming, where's my comedy sketch for this week? Couldn't tell him there was nothing left to write about, that there just aren't any new comedy ideas. Well, darling, if writing were any easier, they'd probably pay you less for doing it. Yeah. I'll go get dinner. Uh, we're here drinking coffee. We're stalling. We're, uh... This is... Writing is... Is finding other things to do. We're, we're doing that now. <laughs> <laughs> right away. Right there. But we're ma we have to go make the mistakes now. Yeah, we have to go put the mistakes down on paper. So that we have we something to fix next week. We commit paper. That's, that's why we get the big bucks. <laughs> Roseanne's going to be Santa at the mall, which frightens all of us. But uh, that's what it's going to be. And so she has this whole thing about, you know, Santa's... Santa could be a woman. You know, who knows if Santa's really a man? Have you seen him? That type of thing. So basically, that's, that's what we're shooting for. Now, by the time we tape it, who knows what it'll be. But at this moment, that's the plan. That's what we've laid out, and that's what we're all hoping for. <laughs> we basically get paid, you know, this enormous sum of cash, huge American dollars, to come here and crack jokes and sit around and laugh and eat food out of styrofoam, you know, containers all day. And... Basically, all the jokes that we cracked, that we cracked in school, you know, we, we used to get thrown out of school and made to s sit in detention, and now we get paid lots of money to do the same thing. It's fun. Writers earn a lot of money. They earn, uh, I think that the lowest you can pay a writer is about $2,200 a week. Um, the, the most of the, the writer producers can make up to $40,000, $45,000 a week. And there's guys in between there. Now, there's more guys making the big bucks than there are making the $2,000 a week. So you can come back after the holidays. Job secured. <laughs> okay. Guys like this that are writers and com they're former comics and some of them, and they live in probably a lot of fear because, the, you know, they're used to making six or $700 a week performing in a comedy club. They come here, they start making 10 grand a week, they start making 20 grand a week. And that pressure, they know that, that tomorrow could be over and then they might have to, you know, sell their house or whatever. Um, so it's like 
they got they have to prove their worth constantly. They're they are needed. Their writing is the writing that's putting the show over the top. It's it's you know so it's a puts it's tense. It's tense for them. Santa Claus, Act One, Scene One. We're in the living room. It's evening. Rose and Dan are on the couch, and they're ready to snap at each other, as Dan says. I'm starving. <laughs> Did I not get the right script? <laughs> We're all starving, Dan. Well, then, go in and help your sister with dinner. She won't let me. She's trying to do something nice for us. And we just have to sit here and take it? I, I think we all knew that we weren't going to have a good table reading. There was, uh, there was too many flaws in the script. And then Rosie got it. Rosie and Tom got it on Sunday. We got their notes. And their notes were generally, you know, pertinent because it was rough. And then we had all day Monday to address their notes. But it's still, uh, we were still a day short. So by the time we went to table Tuesday, it was... I was like, I was like, oh, God, and I knew that, you know, I don't want to, it was embarrassing, you know, I like to have a table reading where there's like, you know, just, it's real fast, and everyone's laughing, and the poignant moments work, and none of that happened Tuesday. Let me be Santa, you don't have anybody else, just think of me as the bottom of the barrel, I don't mind. He's got my Christmas bonus. And we're out. Oh. We're gonna go talk, and then we'll give us about five and come out. Thank you for your coat. You're welcome. That was about the time when I thought that we were gonna lose the show, and I was out of the business, and you were gonna get it all on tape. <laughs> um, I think. Uh, there's some real problems with uh, the, uh, the whole form. There's uh, it stinks. Things. I hate it. I think it's got a lot of potential, though. Yeah, right. Like everything else on Tuesday. I bet it's good. I'm right. Should be better on. <clears throat> this isn't even good enough to be a first draft, and I got four days. <laughs> And remember, I'm being nice because there's a camera. Take out that discrimination and make it pay off over here, because that's a good joke about. Yeah, that, how there's. We do all the if we take it off before, it's going to pay off much better here yeah, because that, we've that'll that. do that, and then and then make it funnier over here on. Um, why? Not funnier, but give me a better reason to want to be Senate. All right, he's here's saying the money, the money. Well, he can ask me. Right. Because he's having trouble, you know, this particular episode, and really like this different kind of Santa Claus. And and it's too mean, and it's too sarcastic, and it's too, uh, hey, you know, it's too, it's too math. Well, okay, okay. which. Which scene well, was... I want to relate to them as a woman or a mother. You're talking about in, in the yeah. second act? You're talking about going back and forth. No, wait a minute. No, no, I, no. no, I think we just lose one. Here's what I was pitching. Let, let's see if, if if I'm on target here. Am I speaking English? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's a little bit broken. What I'm saying is that it's wrong for her mother to push her into this preconceived role. And in this that's one, the comment. In this one statement, should, you're going to change the kid's life. Should we start? No, but I no, no. say it. I, I think. It. Well, I. But should we start? It's like being on a kid's side against right. your parent, but not really against your parent. And it sounds like don't let anybody else tell you what you want to be. You could be whatever you want. You to name it, and that's what you'll be. And the kid says, I want to be a tree. Or something, you know. That's, just what, that's what Jenny said. <laughs> I know, I know. That's what I take it. I want to be a tree. Well, no, or she something. Said she wanted to be a dancer and a cow. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be a, a dentist and a cow. Okay. Okay, that'd be good. Okay. Okay. And then you would have a line on that, and that would be the run. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay that'd be good. Right. Okay. Yeah. You, you may as well rehearse it. Anything that you hate, don't rehearse. Okay. Okay? okay. So don't rehearse all. I'll show you this. Well, I have to go to the bathroom now. Do you want to go in there with me? <laughs> she has a way of putting her finger, you know, directly on troubled areas. I mean, 
uh, kind of jump starts this into uh, into because you get so close. I mean, Bob especially. I mean, there you've you've seen examples of how how long and, and hard they work on these scripts, and you sometimes get so close to it that you can't see the forest for the trees, and you need a fresh eye like Roseanne's, and you know, it's something I, I try to provide as well, to stay out of the process and react to the material a little bit later with a, with a fresh eye. Uh, and it kind of, uh, uh, it's always helpful, and always, as you can tell, always constructive. And, uh, and, and always um, yeah. a big energy flow. Yeah. <laughs> Bob Meyer was brought on board fully understanding that the, uh, the priority here was to be a collaborator with Roseanne. It's her show, it's her character, and you know, it's, it's very hard when you're running a writing staff uh, and have to assert yourself and have to have authority uh, to also in, be an emissary of someone else's vision and he's found a way to do that beautifully and not only put her ideas on the page but embellish them and make them better and make them sing let's gather i guess huh? Holly, that's you yep. that's yeah i'm not in there you're not in there when you're ready i think that the morale of the writing team is yeah. to me it's the most important thing Sometimes uh, they can hear things. Remember that they're incredibly invested in, ep in an episode even before I go in for notes with Roseanne and Tom. So they sit back here, and they're not privy to what I am getting. They can only speculate. So they sit in a room, and they say, uh-oh, he's been there for a while now. Oh, no, oh, no, it's all falling apart. Okay, let's try to fix it. Oh, wait, but we don't know if it's broken yet. <laughs> and when I come back, they're a mass of insecurity thing and there's a taste of what you'll see in the second act yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think that and i i said i think the script was better than the reading and uh they had some very specific notes through the course of the of the show scene by scene and um there are some changes but i i don't believe that there are major disruptions cool. to any of it so you'll be here late won't you yeah you'll yeah. be here all night It'll be good yeah. yeah. This is Don Foster. He used to be my husband's roommate. He was my husband's roommate in Minnesota, Minneapolis. And uh, it was six men living in the... And that was another one right there, Sid. Get a picture of Sid. They're great writers, and Rosie, we, we brought them on the show. And, uh, yeah, because they were all kind of left. Left also. That's true. That's very true. And they they're left out. Yeah, left and left out. <laughs> All unemployed guys. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we They're really funny. Yeah, you know, and we we try to, uh, you know, because a lot of the guys, the the some of the guys have never been in the Midwest. You know, the people have lived in California or New York, and they they have no idea what's going on. And they they tend to comment on rather than do. Even in their writing, it shows that they're commenting on this subclass of people that they really have no idea. You know, have no idea. Who they are, what they're about, or anything, but they're they're like, com but it's really frightening because then you know that, like when I look at their writing, I sometimes can tell what they're writing about is other working families that they've seen on television, yeah, not real people. I mean, this world out here is like a mirror within a mirror within a mirror world. Would you? you like hey, do you want to sit on my lap too? You have the right to remain oh. silent, but you'll get no presents. Come yeah, on, it's okay. Sorry, it's all right. Sorry, it's all right. Maybe it's too oh, soft for me. me. Mom needs something to put I loved those a week ago. I don't know. Tell me you want to be a prima ballerina. I'm going to start dressing like this every single day. <laughs> Just another. Every holiday I dress in drag. What else is new? Yeah, like if men can do it, so can I. <laughs> what I really like is the 10 carat diamond ring, <laughs> which Santa great. gave himself as a little Christmas <laughs> present. Ice is plentiful. <laughs> Having Mrs. Claus is a nice gesture. Okay. Then we had this before. Yeah, you pitched a joke. What was that? And it was really funny too. What on the on the not wanting <laughs> not wanting it's children not funny to get No, no, it's it was a joke about Jackie. Nobody cares about Mrs. Claus. Good. Then it's perfect for my sister. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
Good, that was perfect for Jack. That's perfect for Jack. <laughs> yeah. The most important thing is not that how funny these writers are, it's that they understand Roseanne's character and as well as the other characters in the show. To me, the important thing about getting them is that they're, they're so new that they haven't been beaten down yet into uh, the whole form of, the whole sitcom form, which is so boring that you just want to tear your eyes out. They, they still have some spunk is the word, I don't know. Our next performer is a gentleman that you've seen uh, on camera, and he's as good on camera as he is behind the camera, and uh, uh, writing and helping uh, get uh, Roseanne, the show, on the air. Uh, just a simple, plain, home-fed kid from Iowa, ladies and gentlemen. Please put your arms, hands together while Mr. Tom Otto, ladies and gentlemen. Met a famous woman, get a lot of jobs. Um, <laughs> I lost, uh, did a big year, I lost a lot of weight this year. So January, I lost about 100 pounds. Thank you. Thank you. Good in 3D. Completely massive rewrite is what we're doing right now. Uh, yeah. Well, you can you can tell how long the rewrite's going to be, you know, based on how much people put on their plate. We're all anticipating about you know two o'clock, based on that. We haven't had to make a second food run ever this year. We've never had to go out for breakfast or anything like that. This is difficult. We're in trouble on this one. We'll get it. We have in the past. Hopefully, we'll do so again. I don't know. It's a little nerve-wracking at the moment, so that's why I'm singing like a maniac. See you later. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Um. And we'll, we will do a flash pop at the end of uh, Crystal. Instead of I hate it out here. I hate it. It's awful. I hate this f***ing town. It's just awful. I don't fit in here, in case you didn't figure that out. I don't know. It's just really weird. It's really weird, like this new world. I don't know. I, I don't know. Like, uh, before I got famous, you know, like, I, I lived in this trailer and everything, you know, it was really awful, so I worked really hard to get out of there, and, uh, now I make TV and movies, so what do I do all day? I sit in a trailer. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. started out, she was a housewife, and she lived in Denver with her husband and her kids. And uh, she started working as a cocktail waitress. Guys would come in and order drinks, and she would just give them, you know, flack. And she just started, you know, cracking these jokes. And then it became that people would come in to really see her because she said everything that women weren't supposed to say. No one had ever seen it before. She just took the comedy world and turned it on its ear. So awful. And everybody at these parties, you know, nobody's interested in having any kind of fun anyway. You know. They're only there to like kiss the ass of the most famous person in the room, you know, which is always me. And, uh... I haven't a clue what's happening in the room. We're sitting in there so burnt out and so unfunny at this particular moment in time. And um, it's just taking forever, you know? We have nights like this, but not very many. And this is, this is one of them. You're here at a banner week, let me tell you. So, you know, we're just trying to come up with jokes. Do you, have, do you know any? Can you tell me a joke? It's just... How many men here is planning to drink a lot tonight and get really, really drunk? <laughs> That's cool, though. That's really cool because men drunk in public, well, everybody's just okay about that, aren't they? They're just okay. They just don't think it's any big deal whatsoever. Everybody's just, like, totally okay about it. They're like, uh, <laughs> oh, man, look at Frank. 
Oh man, is he f***ed up? <laughs> oh, he's drunk again. He's shit faced. Look at that. <laughs> oh, look at that. He's got his penis out on the pool table. <laughs> in public now everybody just freaks out when you know women see women drunk in public you know because there you are at this party you're having a great time you're all drunk and everything you're over there in the corner dancing with your dress pulled up over your head just having a great time you know <laughs> and everybody's like sad isn't it The best thing that I, the most fun that I, the thing I like most out of everything that I do, more than anything, I like that because you can just say whatever you want in front of people, and I, I love stand up. I'm feeling confused about the script at this point. There's sort, of, for me, there's always like this middle section of I don't know what I'm doing and then as time presses and desperation sets in it's a lot easier to see the light at that point I'm hoping that that'll happen oh not too late sometime soon I think Jennifer had a good pitch on that last one. Oh. <laughs> we are in hell which is a term writer hell which is a term that we use around here to describe a state I think where we can't see the end you know, it just all looks like work from here to eternity. I want you to have what you want. <laughs> well, why didn't you do what I told you to well, do then? You did not. Every once in a while, I think, there is a flashback for her to the old days and the fear that at any moment I'll turn sour, that I'll turn against her. I recognize that my job is to process that and to emphasize it, to make sure that I understand it. Uh, so that I can offer her the constant reassurance that I am there to translate her notes onto screen. And so every once in a while she'll need to just state it loudly. It's hard on him. He takes it personally. And uh, because he's a nice guy. He really is. Um, it's a tough job. And his job is the job that has the highest turnover uh, of, you know, it's a, it's a tough job, and, and uh, he has done it very well for two years. Something I worry about is burnout because of how hard he works. And if that happens, uh, then he, he, he probably would know it and want to take time off. Uh, maybe take a year off or something, or move on to another show. I'm sure he could do anything he'd want. We have to, to decide that at the end of the year. And um, with, with him, of course, because he, he's done a great job. And, it's possible that I could be gone from the series. That is not without historical precedent here. Uh, it's perhaps a little remarkable that I'm still here. I think in another couple of episodes, I might be the longest tenured creative, I mean, writing executive producer of this series. And you have to begin to wonder when that streak runs out. There's no such thing as job security here. Situation comedy is a great gaping maw into which writers uh, were thrown <laughs> and eaten up alive because you're writing 12 and a half hours of original material over the course of 40 weeks, or 35 week production schedule. We have to not duplicate. We have to remain true to the best that we can. 
of the backstory that we've created for all the characters and that eats up a lot of people it eats up a lot of time and it eats up a lot of human beings you'll see 10 writers because it takes 10 writers to i suppose feed this monster and i think that the writers are basically the food of the monster <laughs> Come on, Leon, I want 10 bucks an hour. Oh, change the budget, Roseanne. I want to be Santa. Hey, I want to be Liza Minnelli, but we don't always get what we want. That's a great thing. That's what I yeah. I think Roseanne's comedy comes from the background that she had, uh, uh, growing up Jewish in Salt Lake City, Utah, in a community full of Mormons would tend to make one an outsider. And um, just the, the knocks and hardships that she's overcome have uh, made her, well, she's, <laughs> uh, she took her a bit longer to stabilize than, uh, than other people, but it also, she's a very keen observer of people, things, and places, and uh, she has something to say about almost everything, and it's almost always funny. Pace around in front of him like a cop. Oh, that's yeah. so funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, just, yeah. I thought it's like a way a cop yeah. talks. Right. If we For just change a little bit of the yeah. language to do some, we can probably do yeah. that. Perpetrators or some like that yeah, in there. Right. Right. Crossed out. Mostly, I just crossed out at the end. Sitcoms. I think because there are so many of them, there's. Like, you know, the number that we do every year. You know what I mean? Sometimes things get too slick in the writing of it. And uh, Roseanne can smell it out and like their truffles. <laughs> uh, she can spot these things like that. And she brings a great blue collar, lower middle class sensibility to stopping these things and replacing them with things that are more true to the people that were playing the nature of the thing. Come on, sweetie. Tell me you want to be a prima ballerina like we talked about. Tell me. Excuse me, Mom. How about plie and your butt over behind the uh, rope there? And me and Sally will have a private chat here. Don't worry, Sally. Santa's mom wanted him to be a ballerina, too. But I, I did what I wanted to do, and now I'm my own boss. I only work one day a year, and I'm way more famous than Michael Jackson. You can be whatever you want to be. I want to be a dentist. Okay. And a cow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, little Steven. Okay, nice and quiet, everyone. Okay, so Rosie says. Okay, Jason, what can I do for you? Remember this? Well, now Jason, Santa sees a lot of teddy bears. You gave it to me last year. Well, that's because you were a very good boy. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote you a letter. Ask for a truck. I wrote you a letter and asked for a truck. Now, Jimmy, Bradley, yeah, yeah. you can be sure that after you say... In everyone's life, you know, you've got your... Uh, your situations that are, whether you've had some abuse in your life, and I think everybody probably goes through some growing up, you know, whatever, in relationships. And laughter is something that, that really has gotten us through a lot of stuff. And I think works, it's not, it doesn't cure you or it doesn't make everything right, but it gets you through, those, through a lot of moments. Mm -hmm. And those moments add up, you know, to get you to a place. And I, I think it's, it's super important. Uh, I think in a real ethereal sense, Laughter is a way to, uh, for the individual person to, uh, to make the world right again. I always think of that word nemesis, but it's the way to, I, I, I think it's the way to remember what we laugh at is what's ridiculous. And sometimes what's ridiculous are things that we truly believe down deep. So it's like a, a cathartic way of making the world right. Uh, I think it's very morally important too and you got these no matter what to be able to laugh at, at yourself and the things that have happened to you it just kind of eases it mm -hmm. and you keep it brings to, to your own attention that these things happen to you if you make fun of your childhood it is awful you got smacked around well even if you're doing jokes you're kind of bringing it up for yourself so eventually hopefully you'll deal mm -hmm. with it it's you know a real healing thing yeah yes three 
two. There we go, Jimmy. There you go. Jackie, this kid wasn't next. Sure he was. He was way back in line. He gave me a buck. <laughs> It's more private to Santa. Okay. okay, you can look at Santa a little bit more. Seven times of singing, five golden things. They always go get those Hollywood actor kids with the two buck teeth. And I mean, I don't, how many times do I have to bitch to them about casting? But I just simply don't have the energy to get in there and go to casting, too. I'm not going to do it. All the women in line who aren't black are blonde which is so wrong for Lanford in the Midwest, but it's very hard to find extras okay. who look like they don't live in Hollywood and don't look like they're, they've put on makeup to be starlets for the day. So we're trying to disguise their hair with hats and scarves and anything that makes them not look like, you know, the next Faye Ray. <laughs> scenes to deal with today which we have never even read or rehearsed together he's nurturing he's gentle he loves children i do that all year so let me love and give and nurture okay thank you oh jesus christ <laughs> what's the deal he's coming out to give some notes is he coming out today or what <laughs> So you can put a napkin back in place? I don't get it. John, what are we waiting for? We're waiting for Andy to finish getting notes from the guy. He's going to come trust the guys and he's going to come out and talk to you. Who's giving notes to Andy? There was changes from yesterday, Rose, that nobody saw. Oh, y'all didn't see them? No, there was changes since yesterday in the script and there's changes in some of the moves. So it's like re-blocking almost again. I know. It's a pain. I uh, wanted to cut like the rehearsal time by almost two thirds because you're doing a 22 minute show that's about comedy. Well, comedy has to feel fresh and surprising to the person delivering it or it, it's just not funny. A lot of these shows around here, sitcoms, well, they'll, they'll start filming and they'll film for seven hours, take after take. Well, it just beats you down and I, I just make them do it twice at the most and then on. I'd rather have something on TV that's very rough, and I think that it's rough is what makes it fresh. I, I like the rough edges of it really a lot. I, I really like that, and, and I really like that uh, the actors don't know what word's gonna come out of their mouth every single second, because then, and it's almost like live television. And I, I just think that's what gives the show, you know, the, the, ooh, the spark that it has. I don't believe this. What'd you get, Walter? I don't know, and I don't care. I'm not opening it on principle, because this whole Christmas thing is way out of hand. Here we go. It's unbelievable. <laughs> They're up there for 20 minutes, and it looks exactly the same. Well, they can justify their jobs here. By the way, CJ says you're not coming to the pig <laughs> festival now. You're not, you're not invited to the pig festival. They're taking that away from you. Are you going to not invite me to the pig festival because of what? We're going to slaughter a pig huh? without you. Keep talking about your Brian and the That's right. <laughs> I didn't fire you. You know what's funny about that? She was going, uh, she was going, man, this lighting on this show is so bad. I can't even believe it. It looks brown. I can't believe it. And then the only guy that gets nominated for Emmys is the lighting guy. <laughs> he's, he's like this, this, the best guy in town. I think that, uh, that Roseanne Connor has a certain ego that says, I am the center of the universe and states it very well for everybody out there. <laughs> Which is, a, you, again, it's one of the things that makes the show wonderful is that Roseanne has this point of view where she's unabashed in saying the world revolves around me. Let me be Santa. Oh, please. Come on, I'm jolly. Oh, in that case, no. Let me be Santa. Hey, I want to be Liza Minnelli, but we don't always get what we want. <laughs> I think that it's funny in a sitcom and not in real life because we would never promote ourselves individually as being that egocentric. <laughs> it just isn't funny when a person at home does it. You know, she's not a perfect mother, she's not a perfect wife, yeah. not a perfect person, but she's trying, you know, and she keeps trying and she tries yeah. schemes and scams now and then and... Uh, she's not above lying or... 
and a human she's not above her own humanity which i think on, on television when we watch here you, you know they're just putting these fable myth mythological people on they don't look like anybody real in the world they don't talk or act like anybody real in the world so they're not real there it's that mirror thing again so um, I, I wanted this character to, uh, you know, not have all the answers because nobody does, whether on TV or not, and, and not be uh, perfect in any way. No, it's true. Santa loves children. He takes care of them. He nurtures them. He loves them. I do that all year. Let me love and care and nurture Leon and pay me in cash so I don't have to declare it. <laughs> I don't believe I'm going to do this. I mean, you sure you don't want to be Mrs. Claus? No, it's a stupid, thankless, menial job that nobody even cares about. That would be just perfect for Jackie. I think it's really cool. Um, why I'm a big fan of myself is uh, because I'm getting away with things that I can't believe I'm getting away with. And, and the only reason I think that I'm getting away with it is because nobody knows what I'm doing, which is like really horrifying. It's horrifying and frightening that nobody knows what I'm doing, except for the real people on the other side of the world the other side of the tv set they know because i get letters after letters and on the street people know hey thanks for you know this and that and the other and i i hate to say what they're saying thanks for because i think if people get it they won't let me do it no more but out here they absolutely do not get it and they don't get they'll they'll say things like well it's a it's a show about fat people i mean that's how stupid and shallow they are uh, and and or, or or it's a show about uh it, but they don't, they, they just never get what it really is. And it's a show that's anti-television. And they don't get that. And, and it's not only anti-television, it's totally anti-media. And then they don't get that neither. Because that's who they are. But I think it's great that I can do it because other people do get it. Then I'm really, really happy and um, I just like can go on another inch, get a little braver every week until finally I'm talking about television itself, which I did last in last week's episode that aired, which I thought was great. I was actually talking about the horrible things television has taught my generation. And I'm doing it on television. I just think that's great. We shouldn't even be sitting here watching TV. TV's the whole way my whole generation learned to smoke anyhow. Oh, come on. That's true, Rosie. Jackie. Lucy smoked. Desi smoked. Ward smoked. Uh, make room for Daddy Smoke, <laughs> Gomez and Morticia Smoke, <laughs> Maxwell Smart Smoke, 99, the Chief, Jaime, and he was a robot, but he smoked. Good night, everybody. And don't forget, call for Philip Morris. Oh, oh. Six o'clock on Friday night. Um, I think the show looks in good shape and uh, looking forward to the audience coming in and uh, telling us whether or not we did a good job. Um, this tattoo here, that one is. Or no, it needs a little bit more work to have a little more color added to it. And then what about this one here, honey? Well, I think that's too low. Did I show my other ones before? Have I showed you my many tattoos? Did you see that? See, this is what, I turned Jewish, so I got this one. That's Rosie there. And I've got a bunch of them on my arms and stuff. Let me see if I have time to show. I'll show my tattoos. So. Let me see. Oh, down here. I show this one here. That's, a, that's it without being naked. That's there. That's a Grateful Dead. It's a band from America. So I don't. I don't really like them since I quit using drugs. But I uh, did tell my wife I loved her at a concert. And that's a Rosie. And I have it on my butt too. I want to show the butt. One. Oh, come on. Come on. All right, I'll come on, do it. Come on for England. For the Queen. For the Queen. There it, is. it says Rosie right there. That's her name, right there, Rosie. Well, right there. I don't want to look. Okay, show it, honey. It's Where the wrong it? side. There. Oh, I oh, gotta put my stuff down too low for it. Here, I'll hold this up. Well, yeah, I'll help you. don't we'll make it look like I'm mooning. Okay, here, here see. Okay, turn around this way. See, property, <laughs> property of Tom Arnold. That makes me the fourth largest What's property owner in California. <laughs>
<laughs> is there butter in this squash? My wife just asked someone if there's butter in this squash. No. Everybody always laughs because I go crazy on Friday. But I think everyone has such good humor on the show that they, they, uh, you know, they, they go, oh, there she goes again. Nobody gets, like, scared and thinks I really mean it or anything. Right. I just have to be a loudmouth bitch on Friday. So I keep myself going. She's trying to do something nice for us, Dan, and we're just going to have to sit here and take it. We're never going to eat, we're never going to eat, we're never going to eat. It's not really about the character so much as about a situation, but I don't like that usually, but for holiday shows, it's okay. It's fun. I'm going to be Santa. I'm going to play with little kids. <laughs> Lazy asshole. Kathy, did I thank Bob Iger for that golf cart? <laughs> thank you. I feel like I can't wait till the show's done and so we can go home. And um, it feels like, um, well, there's a lot of stuff going on, you know, it's always a little tense, but we're kind of excited because we get some friends that are in the audience tonight. And that'll be fun. And I, I think uh, we got most of the show in the can, as they say, you know, during the day. So if we screw up, we don't have to keep doing it over and over because we already got it. So okay, it should be a fast show. I'm done. Bye -bye. Look how cute she looks tonight. Bye. You look really cute tonight, honey. Like right that. This is a cheap. Have a good show, everybody. Let's go, Mark. Five, four, three, two. Hey, Becky, what's doing? Oh, everything. What does that mean? <laughs> well, Mark just gave me my Christmas present a little early. Eh, what'd he give you? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kidding. I got it out of a gumball machine. It's a joke. Don't you ever do that again. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought you'd laugh. No, that was not funny. That was cruel. Oh, here comes your mom. Do it to her. <laughs> By the time what comes on stage is such a group effort, that if you got maybe 60% of what you wrote initially in there, you know, it's like, that's like that in a thousand. So, but the flip side of that is when you write a really funny line and it gets a huge killer laugh, that's a cool thing. It's a very cool thing. It doesn't happen very often, but it's a very cool thing. Wow. Wow. Okay, from the top. Let's reset from the top. Okay. I'm not doing it. Honey, honey. Not. <laughs> I think we're gonna do it again. Oh, I hope they do the Okay. Well, you we're completely out of control at this point, so <laughs> we just watch. It's a wing and a prayer. Yeah. Oh. You know, we're in a plane where the pilot has had a heart attack and we're just sitting in the back <laughs> drinking. That's what we do now. Tell George you just have to do it once, you know. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to have people telling you when to do it. I get sick of that. But you make more money, I guess, on TV. As soon as TV has a message, I just want to retch.
Because who wants to learn anything from TV? God, if you have to learn something from TV, you just better go put a bullet in your head right now. Okay, honey, go. <laughs>